Good morning and, and welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you, Drs. Mafane and Fokum, and thank you in absentia to Moses for the, the welcome. Um, I'm always in this strange position of welcoming you to somebody else's house. And so I have to, I have to thank our hosts and at the same time thank you for coming because I've always felt quite at home on all of the previous courses and now on this course um, here in Cameroon. Um, what I'd like to do in a couple of talks uh, just to begin this, this two-week um, adventure is to uh, give you an introduction to the broader training curriculum program, give you a brief overview of the idea of biodiversity informatics, and then give you a specific introduction to this course. Um, so one flaw in my design of, of this morning is that I don't introduce the other instructors and you all until kind of the end of the morning. That's not uh, for lack of appreciation. It's just that it seems like it, it comes at the right time then. So, so bear with me just a bit. Um, so the Biodiversity Informatics Training Curriculum was born um, very slowly kind of over the last decade and a half. It goes back to a series of training courses uh, initially in Mexico and Brazil. And then with, with global support, there was a, a series of courses uh, mostly focused on ecological niche modeling. Uh, and those courses were held on four continents and had participants from, I think, 70 or 80 countries. Um, and those were all, in many senses, a rehearsal, um, partly because they were all on the same theme, which maybe some of us are now tired of doing courses on, so we're not doing that one anymore. Um, but also, they were a rehearsal technologically, because they really reached the trainees in the room and not so much farther. Um, and I think now, with expanding reach of internet across the world, I think now we have the, the opportunity to make these, these courses go a bit farther. So Dr. Mafane mentioned and uh, Moses mentioned some things about biodiversity informatics. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper into that. Um, it is a new field, which is to say there is no textbook. You know, you can, you can uh, find the textbook on population genetics or on phylogenetics or on systems ecology. This field is very different. Uh, in some senses, it's one of the oldest fields. You've he heard of Carl Linnaeus, and what he gave us was a wonderful information system by which to catalog and document the organization of, of life on Earth. Um, and museums for literally centuries have built information systems that allow people to access and retrieve data on biodiversity. So in one sense, the science of managing information about biological diversity is extremely old. Um, and then in another sense, it's extremely young. Uh, the digitization of biological collections began about 1980, so that's probably older than most of you, but younger than some of us. Um, the first collections that were digitized were done in a very skeletal fashion. Um, and that was because of storage space. You know, each of you has a laptop here that could hold easily everything that was a huge data file back in 1980 or 1985. Um, and so really this field has been technology limited from the, from the outset of at least the, the new version of it. Um, but suffice it to say there are no textbooks. 
There really are very few or no comprehensive graduate programs. There are a couple that I know of that are uh, being designed. Um, but a program that really crosses the entire spectrum, which we'll talk about in the next uh, few minutes, uh, there really does not exist such a graduate program. So you can't go somewhere and do a PhD in biodiversity informatics or a master's. Um, there are also quite few training resources. You know, there, there are not uh, even informal, non-programmatic resources out there. And that's, that's actually something that surprised me quite a bit as my colleagues and I scoped out this, this uh, more comprehensive uh, program. And at the same time, as you all well know, um, this is a pressing field. This is not an esoteric field that we are involved in just because of its inherent, inherent interest. Rather, this is a field where, you know, if, if biodiversity is not attended to in the short term, it won't exist in the long term. Uh, there are pressing economic, social, and natural resource related <coughs> needs that derive very directly from good management analysis and interpretation about biodiversity. So again, it's not something we do just out of curiosity, but rather there's, there's a very specific need. So again, we can go back to the roots of this field. These are just pictures of natural history museums from around the world. And you see a lot of these are very old buildings. Um, <coughs> that's my favorite. Looks like it's about to fall down. Um, the building where several of us work is 100 years old. Um, and that kind of speaks to this, this elderly stature of biodiversity informatics. And in fact, a lot of the things that we do today are pretty much the way they were done 50 or 100 years ago. These are just some pictures from around the Division of Ornithology where uh, Mark and I work. Um, preparation of skeletons. Everybody has a freezer full of dead birds, at least everybody who does birds. Preparation of skeletons, specimens in formalin. Um, notice, you know, that's a pretty ugly picture. It's the bones of a bird. But notice that we're already managing information here. Okay? Those seven characters on that aluminum tag, it's aluminum because the, the workers who clean the, the bones are little beetles who will eat anything else. Um, but those seven characters are a unique identifier for this bird specimen, which tie back to a whole world of data. And if those data are lost, like if that tag were to be lost, then we lose all of the data associated with that, with that specimen. And so we have an elaborate, very 19th century system of data maintenance. These notebooks, um, you can look at notebooks that were prepared 100 years ago by our predecessors' predecessors. And they're really the same format. And we're still using 100% rag paper uh, basically ground up cloth. Um, and we're still using India ink, which is essentially permanent. So much of what we do in managing the information is very old. You know, these are catalogs um, from, from bird collections. Um, I'm not seeing from which country they come. But this is somebody with very good handwriting and certainly in the group you will see people who have very readable handwriting and then you'll probably also look over Mark's shoulder and see a counterexample. When Mark and I arrived in the bird division at the University of Kansas, we were still 
cataloging in these old ledgers. Okay. Uh, there was a digital catalog of the collection which our predecessors had developed. But when we arrived, basically nobody in the bird division knew how to get into those files and work with them. Uh, it took us about a year to be able to do that. So at the close of that year, approximately, we said, okay, done with the ledgers. And so we, we eliminated one step in the process. But really, we haven't eliminated any more steps in the process. And later in the week, we're going to talk about data replication and data security. And that really will be a repeated theme in this uh, in this course where we're, we're not just talking about how to record the data or how to maximize the, the amount of data we record, but rather what we're talking about is how to avoid losing any data. Because next week when we're out in Corrup National Park, the data are there. The information is there. And then the question is how do you capture that information, preserve the information, systematize the information, which is to say make it organized in fields so that people can search and access and retrieve the information. But then also, uh, how, do we, how do we share that information globally? so that these information gaps that we've talked about stop existing. Um, there's a view into those ledgers. You can see there's not a lot of information in there because I think people were not wanting to copy all of the catalog data. So right there, there was kind of only partial data replication. There was more information preserved in this system, another information management system. Um, these are catalogs and field notes, and they come in threes. Each researcher in the field, each night or each day, would essentially do three things. One was the field catalog, essentially specimen by specimen. Specimen 1,234 is this, 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 and all the data. The second volume was what they called species accounts. And this was your notes on each species. So maybe some of those individuals of the species were specimens or became specimens, but some of them were observations. And so there was a richer quantity of information in those field notes about each species. And then the third was uh, the actual notes and uh, essentially a field diary and particularly that includes um, an itinerary and descriptions of localities, many times photographs and maps. And so this was another very complicated uh, information storage and retrieval system. Um, you'll hear and across all of these courses, there's this repeated mention of Joseph Grinnell who was the first director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley, California, near San Francisco. And Grinnell invented this system of essentially keeping field information. And a lot of what we do right now is derived 100 years later, evolved out of the Grinnell system. And we still keep those um, those notes and they're in a bank vault in our building, they're so valuable. So let's come a little bit more modern. And again, this is a bird view and you'll see in the course of this week, you'll see two other major taxa discussed. But essentially, our specimens are usually these um, dried skins. We have two other major um, forms in which we prefer, preserve birds. You're going to hear a lot more about this, especially from Mark. But we have these very awkward tags that we use for keeping our information. Um, you can see they have a front and there's a back. Um, there are these little details like 
you have to be able to hold the tag and simply flip it like this or Mark or I get very upset because we have, you know, there are these things that have been done for centuries. You also notice that some of the data are in ink and some of the data are in pencil. And that's because we want to be able to change species identifications because those do evolve through time. And we also want the original data like where and when and who those data should never change, and so those are in permanent ink. These are egg specimens, these are new ones, and then those are old ones. Um, you see, Mark, it's not just, the, not just you that has bad handwriting. Uh, but the, you, can, you can generally figure out the age of a specimen just by how much data is on the tag. So, you know, these are, these are information rich systems. This is the best photograph I have of what these guys do for a living, which is, we call them pickles, but they're specimens in formalin or ethanol. And this is kind of our nightmare because it's very hard to put that full tag on a specimen. And so we do this. And that's something that we hate, and we'll talk about that. Why should we hate that? But it is something that I hate and you guys should hate because what happens if you lose the other half, you know, the catalog or the ledger that tells what P1318 is? And so that's the danger. That's why we hate it. Uh, but most of our specimens end up looking like this. And they're stored in these cabinets. Um, the cabinets are at least allegedly um, airtight, pest-proof, light-tight, um, and that's mostly a true statement. So that's, that's kind of where we stop being 19th century, okay? Up to here in what I've shown you are really things that would have been done in the 1920s, okay? And that's where then we see big opportunities opening for this field. So for example, now we can capture data in a much more rapid form. Um, this is a picture of data being captured from herbarium sheets. Um, and some of you may know about an initiative in which Moses is involved, um, which is and I, the idea of 